Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Denise. Uh, this is actually my first year ever at Lisa, so I'm super excited to be closing at the conference. It's been a super great three days, so thank you for having me. Um, so I want to actually start a little bit differently. Um, I've seen a couple of tech speakers starting to do this thing, and I think it's a really great practice. So I'm going to actually start with a land acknowledgement that the city of Portland is not, has not always been the city of Portland. Um, Portland is built on the unceded traditional tribal lands of the Multnomah, uh, Kathlamet, Clackamas, and other Chinook bands, the Oregon City Tumwater, the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Malala, and many other tribes who make their homes along the Columbia and Willamette rivers. In using this land, it is important to acknowledge the policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many Native and Indigenous, uh, indigenous and Native American families today. Um, this land acknowledgement is adapted from uh, this link, pcc.edu, so if you want to see the long-form version, there's a longer version there. So, uh, by way of introduction, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, my Twitter handle is going to be on all the slides later. Um, I just want to say that you may freely take pictures and share anything that you see today. Uh, I made all the art in this deck, and I use Creative Commons licensing for everything. So if you see a picture that you're like, wow, I really want to, I don't know, use that picture of a cat fire extinguishing a server on fire in my deck or my blog post, then feel free to just attribute me. That's cool. Um, so I currently work as a software engineer in the R&D business unit of Pivotal. Uh, I currently work on a project called Concourse CI, which is an open source tool that people usually use for application CI CD, but you can use it for anything that involves continuous job doing. Um, I currently uh, live in Toronto. Go Leafs. Okay, thanks to the one person who is also from Toronto. Um, and that's my Twitter. And uh, when I'm not doing stuff like this, I'm usually making art related to tech. And most of my stuff is up there. Um, high resolution copies of everything that you see here is also there. Cool. So here's a rundown of what I'm going to cover today. Uh, my slides are already online at my website. They will also be published later. Um, so we're going to start with a brief history lesson on why distributed systems are even a thing. And then we'll do a recap. You'll get it by the end of the talk if you don't now. Uh, we'll dive a little bit deeper into networks, and we'll sort of segue into a closing discussion on why, on uh, technical and non-technical mitigation strategies to deal with the challenges of operating distributed systems. So, story time. How did this all happen? How did we get here? So a long time ago, in a data center not too far away, all business applications were generally were kind of structured like this. They generally talk to a single database. That database is hosted on a company's on the company's own hardware, and that database probably lived on the server that was in a basement or some windowless room because people were like, "Sysadmins don't get Windows." Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, So client-server architecture was pretty straightforward. They looked like this, um, and this worked for a really long time because business data was the core value of these companies, of these systems, rather than the applications themselves. So if you had more data and higher fidelity data, then that was, a, that was your competitive advantage, right? So everything else sort of existed to facilitate the transfer and storage of that data. But somewhere in the 1990s, that stopped being true. Uh, computers stopped being an absolute cost center for many companies, and the technology itself started becoming a differentiator, like a source of value. So we had to start thinking more about the system as a whole, and not just as a transport vehicle for data. And of course, the way that we stored and retrieved this data evolved. So today, it's usually not sufficient for most companies to just have one massive uh, SQL database in your server closet. Um, usually, like most companies have more uh, complicated business, uh, more complicated data storage and retrieval needs now. Why? Well, one thing is that data-driven business analysis is increasingly important. And people who are like business analysts or product managers or whatever it might be, they want large amounts of data, probably sitting in a dedicated data warehouse somewhere, that they can use to run expensive SQL queries on to uh, develop business intelligence on what the next thing is, to, what's the best feature to develop next. Uh, but also things like machine learning and natural language processing and artificial intelligence have introduced a whole new set of requirements for how we retrieve and store data. We want to interact with our data in much more rich ways than we used to want to. And finally, we just have more data than we've ever had before in human history, but we also want to process it faster than before. So we have intermediate data, sort of like caching layers like Redis that help us to access our data faster. So to meet the evolving needs of businesses, we first started by scaling vertically, which simply means to bolt more compute power onto the machines that we already had. 
And this worked for a really, really long time, but at some point, it no longer made financial sense to add that last 1% of CPU, maybe. But even for people who were willing to pay huge amounts of money, at some point you just hit the current limits of hardware engineering. Um, so at some point, you're going to start to race against Moore's Law, which I didn't make a slide for, but it basically states that roughly every 18 to 24 months, overall processing speed for computers double because of innovations in circuit boards, um, although that, that interval is getting longer now. So fortunately for us, though, uh, like never mind Moore's Law, uh, we got cloud computing in the late 90s, early 2000s. So of course, you have your public clouds like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, and you also have on-premises solutions that take your hardware and make it look like a cloud, uh, like VM, uh, vSphere by VMware is one example of it. I know there are many other options out there. So cloud computing gave us an easy way to provision new machines in an on-demand fashion. So we are no longer constrained by vertical scaling limits because now we can horizontally scale. So we can take that same workload and we can distribute it over multiple machines. But why would someone want to do that? Why would you want to leverage cloud computing to scale horizontally? There are a couple of reasons. This is not an exhaustive list, but one reason is scalability. So sometimes one machine can't handle the volume of data that you're looking to store, or maybe even the, the size of the request that you're looking to process. So one solution is to take that data and split it across multiple machines. So you might, for example, shard the contents of a database into multiple chunks by some index and distribute it over a couple different machines, um, like encyclopedias are you know, or, uh, chunked up by first letter, which is a real world example of sharding. Another reason is availability. So when you're operating with multiple machines, you also gain this ability to replicate your data, store the same data in more than one location. So by having your data served up by more than one machine, you build redundancy into your system. So if USC one goes down, your customers are not completely out of service. And the final reason is latency. So if you can find a way to store that data physically closer to where your end users are making requests from, it means that that data will have to travel over less fiber optic, optic cable and you'll have faster request times. So there are more reasons than this, but this is sort of a high level overview of I think some of the most important reasons to horizontally distribute. So let's step out for a second. Let's uh, step back for a second. <laughs> step out and zoom out at the same time. Um, so what does it actually mean to run a distributed system in the year 2019? I think in order to answer that question, we should look back to, we should sort of go back to history a little bit. So I think today it's, most, it's pretty clear to most people in this room, either through intuition or lived experience, that building and operating distributed systems is fundamentally different from a system where everything is function calls on the same machine, in the same, the same physical uh, machine, the same process space, et cetera. But that actually wasn't always obvious. So there's this great paper from 1994, one of the earliest discussions about how distributed computing is fundamentally different than local computing. This is the 1994 paper called A Note on Distributed Computing by J uh, Jim Waldo, Jeff Wyant, Ann Woolrath, and Sam Kendall, who all worked at Sun Microsystems together. This paper is a super cool read also. Like, it's super cool to read it in 2019, because at that, at that time, no one was really building you know, large-scale distributed systems like we have today. So a lot of what they wrote about was theoretical, and they were guesses at what the future might look like. Um, and also, I think some people in uh, 1994 were kind of like, oh, so this is okay, like, whatever scaled problems we have, hardware engineering, we'll just sort that out by the time we need to cross that bridge. Did that happen? I don't know, maybe. So I think this paper is really worth reading in its entirety, but I'll try to summarize the key points briefly here. So in the paper, they identify three key reasons that distributed computing is going to be significantly harder than local computing. Latency, specifically uh, the difference in speed between processors and networks, uh, memory access, and partial failures. So I would say, like, of these three, I think that memory access has, is the one that turned out not to be such a big showstopper, because today, in most cases, sharing memory is not the most common way that processes communicate with one another. Unless you're writing a lot of super, super low-level stuff, like most people who work at the application level design systems to pass messages across that boundary rather than passing pointer addresses. Um, because it's one of those things where even if you can do it, you're asking for additional complexity that's probably not core to what you're, the problem that you're trying to solve if you like, reason in terms of pointers rather than content and rather than messages. So we'll dig into partial failures later on. But sort of close out this thread, uh, a lot of you may have come across the term shared nothing architecture. And that basically describes the world in which we are not sharing memory. We are not sharing CPU and not sharing physical resources across different processes. Uh, rather, we're just passing messages over a wire. So 
Okay, the next slide is pretty dense. This is the whole thing. When I was reading the paper, I decided to illustrate it, and if you want copies, I brought copies, so don't worry, this is also on my website. If it's not, then I'll put it up later. Um, yeah, I have copies of it, so come up to me afterwards if you want one. So, more on partial failure modes now. So according to Martin Klepman, who wrote this great book that I also recommend you read, called Designing Data Intensive Applications, it means that you have a lot of different processes, they're running on many different machines, and you only have message passing via unreliable networks with variable delays, and the system might suffer from partial failures, unreliable clocks, and process pauses. So distributed computing is really, really notoriously difficult to reason about. Um, anyone who's operated one today can probably relate to at least one of these, uh, these problems. Like, it's super easy to make mistaken assumptions about how they work. So this is another uh, piece of, I guess, like a work from 1994, a group of people different group of people, mostly, at Sun Microsystems, came up with a list of seven common fallacies that people make when it comes to reasoning about them, and number eight was later added by James Gosling, who designed Java. So quickly in order, um, the first fallacy is that the network is reliable. We know today the networks are not reliable. I'm gonna dig into this a lot more later on. Um, but other things like latency, like of course latency is not zero, bandwidth is not infinite, uh, networks are not secure by default, Topology is often variable and it's different. Um, oftentimes you'll have more than one administrator. Transport costs are not zero. <laughs> if anyone went to Corey's talk earlier today, you'll know, like, of course, like, data transfer is not free. People, maybe people who use AWS <laughs> wish it were free, but of course that's not the case. And finally, uh, networks are not homogenous because we have people using different devices these days, and that's something we have to account for. So, and on top of that, like, to further pull at this thread about unreliable message delivery, uh, like, this is totally a thing. Like, unreliable message delivery is just a fact when you're operating across uh, network distributed systems. So the classic scenario that people like to talk about is the Byzantine generals problem. So imagine two generals who are trying to coordinate a war or something, whatever generals do, but they can't reach each other directly. So they have to rely on this message sender who is kind of an unreliable little dude. So in the end, the generals can't know whether the message relayed was actually accurate and from the, his you know, fellow war maker, <laughs> whatever. So this is kind of like a silly representation, but this principle happens all the time in distributed computing. So we have some tools today, like you can, for example, use TLS with like hosting verification to mitigate some of the risk uh, involved in message sending, but we always have to be thinking about other things like spoofing and tampering and messages that just get corrupted mid-flight. So it kind of feels like at this point we're fencing off a lot of things that are not true. Like there's a lot of unreliability in the world. So how can we start to reason about what is true? Uh, also, this cat is panicking while eating popcorn. So if you get the Unix joke, I'll give you a high five later. And if not, I'll explain it. So one thing we can do is we can try to build observability into our systems. We can be deliberate about tracing requests, about adding monitoring, about coming up with definitions on what we think system health looks like. Uh, we can monitor the things that we know about and try to do, you know, try to observe and use like uh, instrumentation to try to understand the bottlenecks and the weak points in our system that we don't know about yet. And we can also use tools like controlled fault injection and chaos engineering uh, as a practice to try to understand about how our systems behave when additional variables, when some uncertainty is introduced. So there are a lot of things that we are just not gonna be able to know though, right? But we can know one thing as people who are at the helm of massive distributed systems, we can know that shit's just gonna fail. <laughs> brings us to part two, the CAP theorem. So the last time I gave this talk at SRUCon, I was talking about Dr. Eric Brewer, and I was like, yeah, he came up with the CAP theorem. He debuted it at this uh, Principles of Computing Conference in a talk called Towards Robust Distributed Systems. And someone at Google came up to me and was like, oh yeah, I really love that representation of Brewer. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And he was like, I work just down the hall from Brewer. I'm gonna show it to him. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> but I think it ended up it was fine, he hasn't like complained or anything to me. So we'll see. <laughs> so all over the internet, people like to formulate the CAP theorem as this. Uh, here are three things, you can have two of them. So, which means to suggest that you can design distributed systems so that you can like not have consistency, but have the other two, or not have availability, but have the other two, and so forth, um, in favor of the other two. But that's not really true. Like, that's an incorrect formulation. I think that's a disingenuous description of what the CAP uh, paper says. 
because you can't actually design a distributed system this way. Uh, so there are a lot of different mental models for talking about um, these trade-offs today. Like CAP is not the only, it's not the be-all, end-all. But if you want to use CAP as an analytical tool, you should at least think about it like this. Uh, it's because you can't sacrifice partition tolerance for reasons that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, distributed systems, even when you run them within one data center, are never going to be 100% immune to network partitions. Like, the only way you could 100% prevent that possibility is to have only one node, at which point it's not a distributed system. So let's go through what each of these mean a little bit more slowly. So C is for linearizability. <laughs> it's funny because it doesn't begin with C. <laughs> so what does this mean? Um, this means that, so the, the CAP paper describes this using the word register, which you can kind of think of as like one database table, one entry, which can only have one value at a given time. So if you have two operations that change a register at time zero and time one, where time one is later, uh, so the cat gets flipped from hungry state to full state, if you have any client connected to this data store and they see T1, it means that everybody else has to see T1 from now on. Nobody can ever see T0 after, after a single person, a single client has seen T1. So this basically creates a demand for instant and universal replication, which is really, really hard, if not impossible. Um, so because repli if, like, we know that replication lag can't really be zero, although there are a lot of great, uh, there's a lot of projects out there. I think like etcd gets really, really close to this. Um, but still, you have electric pulses that need to travel along some cable for some amount of time for data replication to happen. So we're basically upper bound by the speed of fiber optic data transfer, if nothing else. Um, but of course, database engineers spend a lot of time trying to get as close as possible to instant and universal replication, but it's tough. And there are always going to be other trade-offs when you decide that that's the thing you're optimizing for. And also, oh, I forgot the closing paren there. Sorry, <laughs> doesn't compile. Um, uh, you can't really have eventual consistency. Um, that's not part of the CAP formulation uh, because consistency is a spectrum. Um, so I really like this blog post by Kyle Kingsbury where he talks about a lot of different ways to define the word consistency. So he mapped out all the different definitions that we use and what each of them imply. And I really recommend checking out this blog post if you uh, have some extra brain cycles, because uh, it's really mind-boggling. But I think the key takeaway here is that consistency is not a binary state. It's a spectrum. There are a lot of different degrees of consistency, so we have to be really deliberate and careful about which one we actually need and which one we're talking about. So A is for availability. Um, another thing that we tend to think of in, you know, as being a binary state, but again, availability is also not binary. Uh, in reality, things are a lot messier because of network latency, which wasn't, you know, it's not accounted for when you're talking about theory. Um, the cap is, like, theoretical. So network latency gets really challenging to reason about because uh, at some point, we as humans have to make a decision about whether a node is unresponsive or just really, really slow. So it wasn't part of the cap formulation, but I think it has some really important impacts in terms of how we detect and respond to network partitions specifically. So how do we deal with things being slow? Well, a common solution here is to just set a timeout. Just decide that above a certain threshold, we're just not going to wait anymore. But determining what constitutes a reasonable timeout can also be a difficult challenge on, it, like, on its own, because how well do you know your system? How well do you... Uh, like actually no, um, like imagine you're setting up a new system for the first time ever, you have no historical data. So the first time you ever do this, you might as well, I don't know, it's like roll some dice, I guess, or just pick something out of the air that feels reasonable. And so the final part of CAP is P. P is for partition tolerance. Um, a partition in this case refers to a network partition, also called a network fault, a network split, lots of other names for it. Um, network partitions occur when network connectivity between two, uh, I wrote data centers here, but between two things, it doesn't have to be data centers because it can be within the same data center, network connectivity between two hosts running your nodes um, gets interrupted. So during a partition event, your nodes might as well be on opposite ends of a wormhole. You can kind of think about them like this. So there's no way to know if the state of, what the state of the other side is. You don't know if the other side is operational and still responding to health checks or if it's continuing to process read and write requests from the other side of the partition. So, quick recap, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So let's quickly prove the CAP theorem. Um, this is actually pretty straightforward. So imagine that you have 
you should never actually have a cluster with two nodes, but this is for simplicity. Imagine if you have two nodes and you have a bunch of clients connected to them, uh, a partition event happens and nodes get divided on different sides of the split and clients are still connected to both sides. So you basically only have two options for what to do now. Uh, assuming you want to keep everything online, assuming that shut it all down is not an option. Um, either you can let clients on both sides of the partition continue to write and read data, which necessarily results in the loss of linearizability because people on the wrong side of the split are not going to see the most up-to-date data. Or your second option is to stop writing on one side until the partition ends, which results in the loss of availability. So let's dig a little bit more into partition tolerance. Um, and I want to talk about networks a little bit more deeply here. Network partitions are inevitable. How inevitable are they? Uh, so when I was doing research for this talk, I wanted to find some stats from real world examples of people running large scale distributed systems. And I think that Google is pretty good at this. So in the first year of a Google cluster's life, it'll experience five rack failures, three router failures, and eight network maintenances. And this comes from Jeff Dean, who has studied this space a lot, is one of the experts in this space. So why is this, though? Like, why can't we just build stuff that stays up and is reliable? There are a lot of reasons. The first category of reasons is that hardware is just eventually going to fail for reasons that you can't control. For example, some unknown agent could invade your data center and knock your router off of a rack and knock your Wi-Fi <laughs> offline. This has definitely never happened to me before. Um, the cables holding together your racks could also just give out over time. And apparently sometimes sharks mistake undersea cables for fish and decide to chomp on them. Uh, although some journalists at Ars Technica want you to know that sharks are no longer a threat to subsea internet cables because Google and Facebook, who lay many of our new undersea cables, wrap them in Kevlar. Um, I don't know if we should be concerned that Google and Facebook are building subsea cables, but that's another talk. That's a separate discussion. So the second category of reasons why uh, you're just going to experience network partitions and something you can't will away is that the software that runs the applications that you need to be networked are like the software is just going to behave weirdly from one to, uh, every like every once in a while. So. In multi-tenant servers, which is almost always the case for public clouds, uh, you're never going to have resource isolation that's static and perfect, and you don't want that um, for reasons that are kind of out of scope today. So VMs will burst, which means that they'll briefly explode in CPU usage, um, and if your database node is running somewhere else on the same machine, you might have what looks like a network outage over there. Your process could get suspended. Uh, sometimes applications are written with runtimes that stop the world when garbage collection needs to happen. Um, so this causes everything to suspend, also looks like uh, suspended, uh, also looks like an outage. And network glitches just randomly happen. This is not really illustrative. This is just the character glitch from Wreck-It Ralph, which is a great movie that I recommend everyone watch. Uh, but also sometimes people glitch, right? <laughs> like this is not really software, but people straight up do bad things. So like I learned that in 2009, a person crawled into a manhole and chopped through the fiber optic cables serving San Jose. So a lot of people in Southern California were just disconnected for a while. But you're probably wondering, okay, like I'm convinced, like I never thought the networks were 100% perfect anyway. Like why does this, why does any of this matter? Well. Because of the practical reality that some part of every system is always at risk of failing, we can't guarantee that every node in a system will always be reachable, which means that nearly every part of every distributed system is always at some constant risk of failure. Think about how hard it is to coordinate social plans with your friend who is always you know, having bad luck and dropping their phone into, I don't know, a puddle of water when you're trying to coordinate an Uber or whatever it is. So, this whole discussion points to the Fisher-Lynch-Patterson correctness result, which is the outcome of a very famous landmark paper from 1985, which basically states that uh, distributed consensus is impossible when at least one process in your system might fail. So that's a super, super short version. There's quite a bit here to unpack, truthfully, um, but in, that would be a full-length talk in itself. Um, I'll upload some references later that link to some great resources that discuss this a little bit more deeply. But anyway, so we've just seen that in almost every case of running a distributed system, there's at least one element out of your control which presents the possibility for failure. So to manage this uncertainty, we have a whole class of mitigation strategies. Um, so I'm about to also put up two high-density slides. Don't worry about reading everything on them. I also have paper copies of them. I'm going to hand wave over some stuff, but they'll be accessible afterwards. Um, 
So we can simplify the notion of consensus by making it so that only one member of a read-write system can write. Everybody else reads. The person, the node who can write is called the leader. Everybody else is a follower. Leader, replica, whatever terminology you want to use. But the problem with this is that the leader is also a node, like any other, that can become disconnected. So we need a contingency plan to keep things writable in the event that that node goes down. So we use a process called failover. Usually an operator would initiate failover. Sometimes people design automated failover. It sort of depends on how well you know your system. So this is one way to reduce uncertainty around the specific problem of writing data in distributed systems. But suppose we do need multiple members who can write because perhaps we need greater robustness and higher availability for what we're trying to achieve. So there's a class of other things called consensus algorithms, which try to answer the question, what is the next thing that we should record and how do we get everyone to agree that that is the correct next entry? Um, so this is a whole class of solutions for dealing with uncertainty. Uh, some use leader follower inside of them, like Raft. I actually use this leader follower internally. Um, also, so I went to a Raft talk yesterday, but for anyone who wasn't there, did you know that Raft doesn't stand for anything? <laughs> it's called Raft because it's a bunch of logs. Uh... Seriously. <laughs> Anyway, Raft is one of many two-phase commit strategies that try to keep nodes in agreement about what's the next correct entry to add to uh, what is the next correct thing to write. So we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we talked about partial failures. We've talked about the limitations of the cap theorem and the practical realities of implementing a distributed system. But I'm actually not sure we've actually answered the heart of this uh, question, the, the heart of the question, which is why are distributed systems so hard? So, Developing consensus algorithms and engineering to, stand, to withstand partial failures might be technical answers to the problems of distributed computing. And for many systems, having these technical solutions in hand work great. They get you maybe 99.9% .9 of the way there. But we hear stories all the time about large-scale distributed systems continuing to fail over and can, uh, fall over and continuing to behave in unexpected ways. Why does that still happen? So Peter Alvaro, who is a professor somewhere in California, uh, I like, added this slide this week because I thought it was funny. He asked his students to think about this. So that Peter, like, he teaches about distributed systems for a living. So he asked his students, what is the hard thing about distributed systems? If you had to pick one word. One student says, uncertainty? And Peter's like, great, yeah, that's, that's correct. Go write it on the board. Another student said, no, distributed systems are hard because of Docker. <laughs> And the first person's like, yeah, no, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keynote over. No, just kidding. <laughs> so distributed systems are really hard today because holding on to accurate mental models of sprawling system is difficult for us. It's difficult for humans, and it's sometimes impossible. Um, so this is the Woods theorem, Dr. David Woods, which uh, J. Paul Reed also mentioned. So the Woods theorem states that as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's own model of that system decreases rapidly. So I think uh, when I first started out programming, I thought that building mental models is going to be like this. I was like, all right, I'm just going to learn this new thing, going to connect it up in a nice clean node. Like my brain is just going to be this graph database of things that I've learned. It's going to be awesome. But in practice, this is what it looks like more of the time. And Mike, this is how I feel most of the time now. Because we don't always have the time or resources to absorb all the foundational information that we need to build those, you know, like build those links. And a lot of the times, the context that we're building on top of will shift from underneath us. Right? You might be working with a certain set of assumptions, and those assumptions get invalidated because you've uncovered new information about your own system. So more often than not, we're just trying our best to hang on to a few relevant bits, because like computers, we're constrained by the size of our level one cache. So because we can't accurately hold on to or describe those mental models, it gets really hard to communicate with our peers about what we think is happening when things go wrong. For example, if you tell three engineers that we're going to have fish for lunch, they might operate with very different understandings of what that means. Or maybe it's mental models about how our systems actually work under the hood. Because let's face it, the systems we build and run today are really, really complex, and they're only getting more complex. They're bigger than we can hold in the conscious parts of our brains, which makes having conversations about them really, really hard. So the best we can do is try to tease out information about our different mental models by looking for situations that are information-rich proxies. So incident analysis is a particularly ripe area, I think, for mental model examination. And if you want to know more about this, this is not going to be a talk about incident analysis, because J. Paul Reed already gave that talk. So I really recommend you check out what John Alspaugh, 
and his team <laughs> have been researching for the past few years. Um, so how does incident analysis tease out mental models, though? Well, when we can have blameless discussions that focus on learning rather than things like justice or the, you know, whatever, uh, we can have conversations like, well, what do you think went wrong? And someone else might say like, oh, like, that's really interesting. I really thought this was, it was this other thing. Um, think of these conversations as recalibration opportunities. So mental models are really, really critical to operating and building large distributed systems because you're always gonna have at least one person at the wheel in charge of keeping the lights on. And I think um, it's really important to, uh, if you believe that your root cause for some incident or some outage is human failure, I really would encourage you to keep digging um, because I think we've been having a lot of discussions the last few years about how if you think a human messed up, it's probably not that particular person. That person made a decision in the context of a socio-technical system, and it's worth examining what contributed to that decision being made. So, um, and I think some folks from uh, like safety engineering and maybe like people who are SREs and Netflix will speak extensively about how like maybe root causes don't even make sense as a thing that we look for. Maybe we ought to be thinking about contributing factors and take a step back and try to think of these systems as being richer and more complicated um, than just having a singular root cause. So we can ask questions like, uh, what was the design of the system, of the context where someone made a particular decision? Was design really unintuitive? I've like actually seen checkboxes like this. It's really, really stupid. Or maybe like the person who was responsible for keeping a system alive was so frazzled by alert fatigue. There's a lot of research on this now about how like you can, if you, like who takes error messages and pipes them into a different Slack channel than the one that you normally use because there are too many of them? <laughs> yeah, so alert fatigue is a real thing and um, it, it greatly decreases your ability to make sense of what's going around, what's going on around you. But also maybe we fail to understand the assumptions that our users would bring into whatever situation. Maybe that situation is the control room or the situation room. We fail to understand what our users' mindsets are going to be. So I think it's really important to think about designing systems for humans rather than machines. Make the correct choices easy to discover. Make them perhaps the default choices. Uh, let's remember that tools and processes should promote learning and sustainable pace rather than things like uh, prevention of failure or absolute correctness. And I think it's really important to remember to be kind to each other. So I really love the hug ops hashtag that trends every time there's some massive outage because there are people on Twitter who are like, oh, like who are idiots at GCP. It's like, yeah, like could you operate a GCP data? Like I don't think there's many people in the world that could do that. So people get really angry and they're sort of um, like hug ops usually starts trending around the same time where people remind each other to like, we're all human, we all make mistakes. Uh, it doesn't do anyone good to, be, to get angry at each other. Because I think that a superpower that humans uniquely have, machines can't do this, at least not yet, I don't think. Um, humans can empathize with each other, which means that we can imagine the world through another person's eyes. And I think that we owe it to our end users and our teams and ourselves to try to understand and design for the whole system, including the parts that are squishy and human. Thank you so much. My slides are there.